So welcome everybody. I'm really excited to welcome you to this event. This is part of our um, Green at Home workshop series that we do here at Actera. My name is Leo Steinmetz. Um, I work on electrification outreach for Actera. Um, and I'm really excited to have you all here and to have um, Tom Kevitt, who many of you know, um, who's an energy engineer and involved in all kinds of aspects of the building electrification space and a great expert um, to talk uh, kind of about just how to plan for electrification, how to manage your um, energy budget, kind of just the overview of if you wanna embark on electrification projects, what you should know about. So that's gonna be great. Just a couple of notes um, before we get started. We are recording this and we will send out the recording afterwards. So if you have to leave early or if you have a great time and have a friend who you think would um, love to see it, we are going to send that out to everyone who registered on the Eventbrite and you'll be able to catch up afterwards. Um, you can ask questions during the uh, during the presentation in the chat. We're going to have some time at the end to go back through all of those, so they probably won't get answered right away. Um, but you you're welcome to sort of react to things and talk to each other and use the chat um, as much as you like. We ask that you please don't unmute and say anything though during the presentation. But there might be some time to do that uh, right at the end. Um, and then one last thing is I'd like if you're willing to just fill out a poll. Uh, we these um, Workshop events are possible in part because we're sponsored by Peninsula Clean Energy, um, and we are sort of trying to reach particular regions with uh, with these events and get particular audiences. Everyone is, of course, welcome, but we like to know who lives in what county and kind of where our audience is from. So if you don't mind just clicking which county uh, of the ones listed or somewhere else uh, that you live in or are from, uh, that really helps us understand who's coming to these events and plan more of them. Um, so I'll leave that poll up for just a moment while people can click that. I see lots of you already answering. Thank you so much. Great, and I'm gonna close this in just a few seconds. Looks like almost everyone has responded. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, and then without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tom to take it away for our presentation. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Leo. And hello, everyone. It's good to see you, you all back. I see a bunch of familiar faces and names in the chat. So we've got a lot of expertise in the chat. I, I, anticipate a robust discussion that you'll be able to have there. Uh, I won't be able to see much of it, but I'll, I'll get back <laughs> into that at the end. Um, and let me just uh, get this thing launched. All right, now hopefully that's visible to you. Okay. So the first issue that folks face in thinking about all this electrification thing, you may already be over this hump, but a lot of folks are wondering why electrify. And so it's basically that it enables that quick transition we need away from fossil fuels while we still meet all our end use needs. And I use that jargon end use needs, but that's things like hot water for showers and cooking. Uh, you know, we want cooking services and we want comfort in our buildings. And, you know, we want the ability to do our laundry and we want mobility. Those are end use needs being met. And we just want to figure out how to meet them sustainably. And the way we can do it around here with our clean electricity and our dirty fossil fuels is to just pivot off the dirty fossil fuels onto the clean electricity. It's also got those benefits, if you can see my cursor, cleaner air indoors and out. And, you know, it's just horrible to be looking at those pictures you can see from New York City. They're going through those kind of red days that we went through a couple of years ago in September. And it's just awful to see that, uh, you know, promulgating across the country as uh, more people get that visceral feeling for what is climate change and how did it come to their doorstep. So anyway, that's giving me reasons to want to try to see how do we accelerate this. And so I, I work on electrification and the ways to make it faster and easier. 
uh, you, you may hear a little bit of jargon, electrical jargon here between watts and amps. And so just quickly, a watt is a unit of power. And you often hear about kilowatt hours. That's a, that's a unit of energy, a thousand watts for an hour. So it's a lot of power for one hour, makes a bunch of energy, a kilowatt hour. That, that out here in California, that's about 30 cents worth of electricity. And then the thing that we talk about a lot in electrification on the electric panel is our amps. And that's the measurement of current flow. And the reason we talk about those is that current flow heats up wires and we wanna have safety in not overheating wires. And, and so then the electricians and the code are looking at the amperage flow in wires to be sure the wire is rated for that much flow. And uh, what we'll notice is that um, the amps are proportional to watts for any given voltage. So if we double the number of watts we're talking about, we've doubled the number of amps we're talking about. So the way to get to these, the fitting on our 100 amp electrical panels is to pay attention to the watts. Uh, just to paraphrase an old Boy Scout hiking saying, uh, if, you look, if you look after the watts, the amps will look after themselves. Okay, what do we want? <laughs> we want hot showers and cold beer. Those are those end use services. And so we, we want to be comfortable. We want to have cooking. We don't really want the watts or the amps or the volts or the therms of gas. You know, the, they all cost money and taste bad or are dangerous. So the, the only thing we want is to have our end use needs met. So the smart strategy is uh, look at the equipment that can meet your end use needs and pick the most efficient models and right size that equipment so it's not oversized. And then if needed, you might wanna use controls that will help the machines take turns uh, kind of like air traffic controllers so that you can fit more of them onto your panel and get permission to do it and and it won't overheat anything. And then uh, a lot of people get a you know get a loading order into their minds about what things should they do first. And uh, I tried to break that apart and say it's whatever makes sense for you to feel like you want to do. you know we got to meet you where you are. And then if you want to insulate well, and really reduce your home's thermal needs. You do that whenever you get around to it. You know, a lot of folks approach me and they haven't done it in the first 20 years of living in their home. And then they want to defer electrification until after they do it. And I'm thinking, no, no, just go ahead and electrify and you, you can insulate when you get to it. So this whole thing, we use a little more jargon, you know, watt diet. Um, another group that I helped form likes to call it panel optimization because they think that that feels better to people than dieting. So you can call it either name, but it's still the same thing. It's looking after the watts and the power efficiency of the things you're doing in order to, to meet more of your end use needs on a given electrical panel. Uh, that little graphic to, this, to the left shows the results of measuring uh, a uh, dozen homes, how much of their electric panel they were using and how much they had unused. And the blue part at the bottom was their peak electric usage for the whole year, the highest 15 minutes of any quarter hour in the whole year. And then the top of the green bar is the amount of electrical panel capacity they had. So that's just a small sample. We've now seen data sets with thousands of homes sampled. It's pretty much the same result. We all have a lot of space left on the panels, unless you've got a pretty big Bitcoin operation going in your home, uh, you've got a lot of panel space left, or maybe a grow operation. If you've got either one of those, you might be using a bunch of your panel, but most people have a lot of space. Okay, why this focus, you know, why do I talk about this watt diet so much? And it's to save time and money. You can save about $3,000 in panel upsizing costs by not having to do that electric panel upsize by just keeping your regular size panel. You, you can upgrade it if you want from an old rusty panel to a new rustless panel, but uh, it's a lot cheaper to upgrade it than to upsize it and have to go through the PG&E engineering studies and uh, other things which really trigger a lot of time delays if you get into that. Okay, then, then the advantages of this kind of watt diet or power panel optimization you know, for the owner, it's gonna be faster, easier projects. 
you know, cutting out that step of trying to upsize the electric panel and having a two day on site job, which, you know, may have had 12 months of PGE permission before you start. Then also we can lower the total project costs and it, it kind of forces you to pursue high quality equipment that, you know, things like these inverter driven heat pumps that are more efficient because they've got a computer control in them instead of the old bang, bang on and off heat pumps that are either all the way on or all the way off. These inverter driven ones will really modulate the output of the heat pump to give you maximum comfort. They'll just bring your house into a thermal equilibrium and maintain it there at the right power. Uh, also, it'll leave you more future flexibility to do more electrification in the future. And it has power left over for the EV charger and other things like that. Then for a city, we've got lots of cities around us who are trying to meet their climate targets. And so this allows, you know, the Watt Diet will allow faster, easier projects happening in the city with high quality equipment and city staff like that. And with future flexibility, they like that. And less workforce traffic per uh, per home or per building. And then the, all of these things kind of make it more likely that the city can reach its climate goals and get those things going. And then the last the last uh, use, uh, stakeholder I think about is the utility. Again, it's faster, easier projects and less overheating of their transformers. So we've seen examples next door in Palo Alto where too many oversized EV chargers on a block will overheat the transformer. And it's because of those I squared R losses I was talking about with all those cars turning on at the same time to, to charge up and they have too large a circuit a lot of those car chargers are so big and powerful they can can charge up the battery in two hours instead of taking the eight hours uh, at night that the car may have been parked there for out of the 12 hours it was there so really people need to relax and let things stretch out over a little more time than more of us can electrify and for the utilities this watt diet thing and if they would pivot their programs towards it it will extend the transformer lives which mean you know it takes less workforce from the utility to visit each block and to upsize the pole and the transformer that hangs on it to put enough power through to meet everyone's electrification needs. You know, so it's a better, more reasonable workforce match for what we've got going on. And also to, to help accommodate, now there's a big supply chain shortage in transformers. So being able to electrify more on the existing transformers is going to be a great goal. That'll help utilities reach their climate goals. I talk a lot about 100 amp panel examples here, but we hear about uh, you know, places in affluent communities where people are, are getting talked into even bigger panels, going up to 200 and 400 amp panels. And, but even a 100 amp panel can provide 24 kilowatts of power, and that's a lot of power. So, uh, you know, it makes sense to, to recognize all that power and just be able to utilize it. Here's the first quick example of electrification in the left column there, it's unplanned. And in the right, it's if you have a planned approach. And so you might look at different appliances that are not even part of electrification, but like the dishwasher. The difference between a regular dishwasher and an Energy Star dishwasher might save a you know 300 watts on the panel. And then the next row is heat pump water heater. So that's what that HPWH uh, is stands for. The common heat pump water heater is a 30 amp water heater that is, is kind of built. It's a derivative of the old 30 amp electric resistance water heater that is a 30 amp resistance water heater with a little energy saving compressor added on top. But you know, it kind of makes sense to look at more power efficient versions like the 15 amp heat pump water heater. It's got the same compressor as the 30 amp one. And it's just that it has half the backup heating capability. So, uh, which is, you know, rarely needed if you would pick a larger tank of, uh, you know, storage tank for the hot water size. Then the average coefficient of performance, that's what COP stands for, for a heat pump uh, might be 2.8 COP, and that might have you using 4.2 4 kilowatts to uh, make your house comfortable, but you can get a more efficient uh, heat pump with a COP of three and a half, 
Uh, they may use other initials like HSPF, heating seasons performance factor of a little over 11. And that would have you down at, at three and a half kilowatts. So you can, you can save a bunch of watts just by picking these more efficient pieces of equipment and avoiding having a resistor strip with a heat pump. In the old days, back in the 50s and 60s, it made sense to have an electric uh -huh. resistance strip. And so then that was something that people would use to, to back up the heat pump. But now with these computer driven, uh, inverter driven heat pumps, you don't need that resistor strip, especially in our gentle Bay Area climate. And then right sizing that EV charger, not picking the, the 50 amp setting on it and the 50 amp circuit. If you would use a 20 amp circuit for the EV charger, <laughs> it can give you 39,000 miles per year. So that's just the example of a, a few different uh, items that you can choose between. And so you could have a total on the left side of, you know, not planning, it's soaked up 98 amps just for these five end uses. And by planning and picking more efficiently, it's, it's used 40 amps. So these basic steps to the watt diet are to kind of assess what you have. And so this taking a look at what is the service size. So can somebody mute? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Um, uh, I think I might've just muted you, Tom. <laughs> uh, but I, there's there's people coming in and out, so I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, Tom, sorry, I just muted you. If you can unmute my, my bed. No. So I've unmuted now. All right. Yeah, give um, me back. just a, yeah, go for it. Uh, there right. might be a couple more sounds. I'm, I'm trying to see what's going yeah. on. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So the basic steps are to assess what you have. And the first thing you might look at is what is that panel capacity that you have? And what is that service wire capacity that feeds it? And so those will those can be these constraints you want to stay within. And so a lot of people find they have either a 100 or 200 amp panel or 150 amp, but just seeing what it says on that main breaker that is has the service disconnect on it. And then taking a look at what are your, going to be your future needs for power. And so those, you know, just looking at those things and being able to, to figure out, you know, what you have and a little bit about what you're going, and that'll be this this uh, electrification plan, uh, that'll be what helps you figure out uh, how to get all your needs met within the limits of what you have. And so you choose the appliances that can fit. And if needed, like you wanna use some bigger appliances that would uh, without controls exceed your panel capability, you can use some circuit sharing devices that let you get, you know, kind of have that turn taking where different appliances take turns and one has kind of precedence over the other. And so it's like you, some people hook up their dryer and their car charger with a circuit sharing device. And when the dryer's on, the car doesn't charge. And when the dryer is done, the car can start charging on the same circuit. Anyway, those are the different approaches is choosing efficient appliances and seeing if you want to use controls as well and then installing the circuits, installing the appliances, and like I said before, insulate if needed at any time. Uh, one moment, I'm sorry, everyone. I think we're getting a Zoom, some Zoom bombers here, so I'm trying to clear them out, mm -hmm. but I apologize everyone for this. Um, and yeah, you can keep going, Tom, but just let everyone know, I'm sorry about that. All right, thanks. Yeah, so, so anyway, those that was the basic planning strategy. And then the actions are to put in that high efficiency, right-sized equipment and to um, you know pick right-sized appliances. And so work with your contractors to get that. And sometimes your contractors have a bias towards oversizing things because it may meet their criteria better to leave you with kind of a more of a rocket of a heat pump instead of something that's sized to uh, meet your needs. And you know, one of the nice things about a, these inverter-driven heat pumps is 
I pretty much turn mine on in the late fall and it can run continuously to the early spring. It just adjusts its power level in order to keep my house comfortable. And so I might be adjusting my house temperature a little bit, like setting it back a little at night and then back up again. But uh, this thing is able to keep up so long as I don't set it down too low and expect it to, to leap into action in half an hour because it needs a little more time if it's right size to catch up with uh, my heating targets. The other thing about using the high efficiency equipment is it's okay to put in big stout wires, like to put in 50 amp wire when putting in a 20 amp car charger. And so you would put, you would, you know, use the 20 amp car charger and the 50 amp stout wire and a 20 amp breaker. And so the, the breaker and the appliance are sized for each other and they're also sized so that the breaker is small enough to always protect the wire. But that's a, a form of future proofing is just because you follow this watt diet approach doesn't mean you you don't you, you know, doesn't mean uh, you have to put in thin wires. You can put in thick wires and it might save a, somebody else some expense of running wires if they had more opulent needs than you did. So some of the ways to reduce the, the peak wattage, you can weather seal and insulate your house and add ventilation heat recovery. Then that's a kind of a heat exchanger that grabs heat out of your, uh, your exhaust air and uses it to preheat the incoming air. You know, and again, I keep mentioning picking efficient equipment. And so uh, in the resource guide at the end of this, I've got a couple of things like the uh, guide to retrofitting buildings, which goes into some of the more efficient equipment and some websites that compare equipment efficiency, but also then eliminate that need for heat pump resistance strips. You know, we don't need them in our climate. Just if you pick a good heat pump, it'll keep up and avoid oversizing the equipment, but it's okay to oversize the wire. Uh, pick multifunction equipment. So, so I mentioned here a range, and that that's the uh, industry name for when you've got a cooktop uh, with an oven built <laughs> into it as one appliance, one slide-in appliance. So it's doing both the the stove top and the oven in one device, and so it's got kind of internal built-in power sharing compared. To at my house, we we went the other way 20 years ago. We have a cooktop and a separate wall oven. And so I need more circuits for my separate wall oven. But if you remodel, you might get a range. Now I've got a nice combination washer dryer. So it's one machine I put dry, dirty clothes into. And then three hours later, I get dry, clean clothes out of it. And I didn't have to remember to visit it in between and move laundry over. So it's kind of a neat device for saving labor, time, and space. You know, saves about ten thousand dollars worth of floor space in our area. Um, and then these heat pumps—they're a good combination device. They do heating and cooling. And uh, soon we're coming on to, or or they say it's starting to be available as two-way EV charging, where the EV charger can also be supplying power back from the EV into the house to cover power outages. So, so be thinking of these multifunction solutions because our equipment is getting smarter. And then uh, picking equipment that's got this internal power controls like boost settings. We see it like in cooktops, they've got a boost setting. And so that lets us um, kind of use the smartness of the internal power controls on the appliance to give us more end use satisfaction with a smaller circuit. And then there, I mentioned before these circuit sharers, and there's another type called a circuit pauser. It would pause the car charging, say if the whole panel got over 80% of its limit, it might pause the car charger and then check back in 15 minutes to see if the panel was back under its limit again, or back under 80% of its limit, and see if there's a lot of room to put the charger back on. So there's also this ALMS stands for automatic load management systems. You'll see some of those, but those are all those things are good for avoiding these panel traffic jams. Okay. The um this chart is 
is one that I've shown a few times. I actually have an updated version now. I updated the, the uh, cooking options. Okay, so what this chart is showing is how heavy these things weigh on the electric panel and all the different variations. And so in the top set, you can see different ways to dry your clothes. And the very top one that looks like a zero, you know, zero um, panel edition is a, uh, it, it's a, the combined washer dryer machine that goes on the washer circuit. So it doesn't add any load for a dryer. And then the other three are heat pump dryers and then a hybrid dryer that's part heat pump, part resistance. And then the very common electric resistance dryer that a lot of people just call an electric dryer. And so you can see a little bit of scaling about you know how big a weight are those on the electric panel. And then here I've got five options for cooking. Uh, the, like I said, I, when we remodeled my house uh, 20 years ago, we didn't know any better. So we put in a cook uh, cooktop and a double wall oven. So we've got the high power version. But you know, there's now things like um, putting just a cooktop with or a range, which is a cooktop with an oven built into it. And then now there's a battery assisted induction cooktop that plugs into a 120 volt outlet. So you don't have to rewire for this powerful four burner induction cooktop. It's got its own battery built in. And there's the same type of thing that's a whole range. The uh, company called uh, Channing Copper, they have a 120 volt plug-in battery oven range that's got a cooktop and it even has an outlet to to power your other things during a, a power outage so it's really kind of a neat device for skipping the circuit now again in water heaters i've mentioned those 30 amps and 15 amp ones and now there's even a 120 volt plug-in water heater that's my new favorite for easy electrification it can just plug into any regular circuit if you have the shared circuit model that can share a circuit with other things. And it just is running its 450 watt compressor. That's not that big a load along with other things. And we tend to just uh, advise people to pick a bigger tank size. So they've got it lots of hot water and that gives that thing lots of time to recover its temperature. Now here are the, here, the two choices in efficiency. I just came up with two. And it was uh, the regular standard heat pump at a heating season performance factor of eight and a half uses this much uh, power, you know, about 5,000 watts or so. And here was a, it, this orange thing is this resistor strip that some people try to sell you, but you don't need in our climate. If you pick a good heat pump that's, you know, built to deliver more efficiency, like 11 and a half. So notice it's a lot less power picking that good equipment. And now here are, you know, what is that? Seven sizes of EV charger circuits. And this top one here is just plugging into the regular wall outlet with the trunk charger that comes with most EVs. And so uh, that'll give you 35 miles a day, which is about 39,000 miles a year um, out of one of those one, you know, regular 120 volt outlets. The 50 amp circuit that some people get sold is a about a 90,000 mile a year charger. And so it's, you know, a little bit more Indy 500. So here's an example, just looking at full electrification of a 2,700 square foot Bay Area home. What if I went to those minimum power needs of all of those things I just uh, outlined there? So those five different end use needs like the, uh, the trunk charger just plugged in. It actually doesn't count on the electric panel when you're doing code calculations because it's just plugging into a regular circuit, but it can be delivering. You, if you've got a nice big battery in your car, it, you still have 250 miles for a, a day's range, but it can be recharged over a period of time at home, 35 miles a day, say, uh, if you're only charging eight hours a day. If you wanna charge more miles per day, you can leave it plugged in longer. Uh, here's that heat pump for space heating. It can, you know, that uh, three ton heat pump can cover 2,700 square feet of home heating in our area. And then the 120 volt water heater can deliver 
uh, 211 gallons of hot water per day, about 65 gallons in hot water rush hour. Um, so, so you can increase that by just picking a bigger tank size. You know, pick an 80 gallon tank and you can get about 80, 80 or more gallons of hot water out of it with a, a mixing valve. And then the battery range, uh, it can do the full Thanksgiving dinner type cooking of big oven and four burners. And then these combined washer dryer machine can be doing seven loads of laundry. And these are the big washing machine size, the 4.5 cubic foot size big drum for a washer. So you can get a lot of loads of laundry per day. Anyway, summing that all up was only 18 amps counted on the panel. And so this might leave, say, 30 amps left over on most 100 amp panels. And then you could kind of ask yourself, well, where would I want any additional opulence in one of my end uses? You know, which one or two or three or five would I want to increase above that if I had leftover space? So, so that's an approach of just, you know, starting efficient and small and right-sized, and then just saying, okay, I know I can get there. Now, where do I want to relax that planning and go for more opulence and do a little more man spreading onto the grid? So, so one thing to imagine is California without a Watt diet approach. And so what we might have is homes try to electrify with that common 30 amp heat pump water heater with that common 50 amp EV charger with 40 and 50 amp heat pump circuits with maybe with resistors with that common 30 amp dryer and wanting to add 10 kilowatts of solar. Well, that alone usually makes people want to upsize their panel. But we quickly run into the workforce shortage problem that we have electricians in short supply to do all that upsizing and to add those circuits for the water heaters and things. And then the PG&E distribution staff, you know, the ones who take care of the poles and wires in our neighborhoods, they're swamped by that. And the, all the service upsizing and the logistics and the pole top transformer loading and burnout and the upsizing of those and the putting in bigger, uh, bigger poles to hold the stouter transformers and things like that. We just kind of rush everything into too much acceleration. We end up with kind of no happy customers, a lot of finger pointing. So, so if we do this with a watt diet, instead, we've got many more homes who can electrify with these devices and stay on their existing electric panels. And then the electricians are able to cook, keep up with the actual circuits needed, like cooking circuits for the folks who want to use the 240 volt cooking that's common. And the PG&E distribution staff would be more able to keep up if they had fewer upsize requests. And so we'd have happy customers, less wait time for things and shared progress. And luckily the ball is rolling on this stuff. So uh, local Senator Josh Becker was able to uh, get uh, signed into law SB 68, which will have the Energy Commission study and share information on all this panel optimization and efficiency approach. Same as they've done for building efficiency, but now for electric panel efficiency. And also we formed a power group, which meets to take a look at these issues and develop um, policy approaches and program approaches and technology fixes. So that's going on. There are also concierge for firms that are forming that help customers make electrification plans. And it's good to see that happening. There's a group called Quit Carbon out of San Francisco and they offer free plans uh, for uh, doing electrification. And then there's a number of different companies now making electric planning apps to be able to do this stuff I'm talking about with an app. You know, I started it with a spreadsheet, but folks are picking up on that spreadsheet and turning it into more useful apps. And then the Department of Energy has sponsored some improved products and processes through competitions. That's nice to see. There will be things coming out of that and new products coming to the market like additional 120 volt water heaters. This, this is just a little picture of inside these electric service panels. And I, I show this one so you can see the two different bus bars. That's what these two aluminum bars are and they have the spaces where the circuit breakers plug onto and usually when you're getting 120 volt power you're just getting power off of one bus bar and when you're getting 240 
volts of power, you've got a breaker that's spanning both bus bars. And so it's, it's that which are at opposite voltage. And so then it gives you the full 240 volts. So that's how your panel's able to do that stuff. This is just a little plot that kind of differentiates in the bottom axis annual energy use by the different end uses. And then the, the vertical axis, it's the panel counted kilowatts for each end use. And so you can see a little bit of difference here in these different end uses and approaches I've been talking about, like look at the car chargers. So for, for going, I think this was probably 15,000 miles a year, the annual energy is the same no matter what circuit size you pick, but the number of amps counted uh, in your project for whether you have space to electrify everything or not is really different based on what size circuit you pick. And then uh, the heat pumps are over here. Here you, with heat pumps, you can see we save some power on this vertical axis. We also save a lot of energy by picking the more efficient heat pumps down towards the lower left end of the scale. And also ducted central heat pumps take more power and energy than ductless heat pumps that don't lose heat into the ductwork. So that's the difference between those two lines there. And then here's a few different water heater lines. Here's the resistance electric water heater. And then here are the three different efficiencies of heat pump water heaters and the three different power levels. Oops. Three. To, so that's the 30 amp, the 15 amp, and the 120 volt down there. And here's a few of the dryers. And there's the electric resistance common dryer. And here's those more advanced heat pump and conden condensing dryers that I talked about. Anyway, that's just another example of planned and not planned. But anyway, so my partner, Josie Gaylord, and I uh, did a study for the uh, San Mateo County, and we found a number of kind of silver bullet devices that were really helping us stay on, on the existing 100 amp panels. And those were the 15 amp water heaters and the new 120 volt water heaters. And then these uh, super efficient um, heat pump space heating, which was only 17 amps for an inverter driven three ton heat pump and uh, upsizing the water heater tank and adding a mixing valve to compensate for the slower recovery time that gave people lots of hot water during hot water rush hour and let their water heater reheat while the electricity was cheap across the middle of the day. Uh, there were times uh, one of the projects didn't have enough space for one of the regular heat pump water heaters. They had it in, under their house in a short crawl space and they used a split heat pump water heater. That can be a solution. Um, heat pump dryers and combo washer dryers. And then uh, there were a couple of different brands of EV chargers that let us adjust uh, how much power the EV charger was getting. Uh, even this Empora, uh, um, they have a smart EV charger that says it can actually measure the current on the electric panel and adjust itself down and kind of throttle itself back if needed uh, in order to, to avoid having the panel go over 80% loading. Then there were a couple of these different circuit sharers. And also, you know, some people want to go whole hog and replace their regular uh, dumb panel with a smart electric panel where every circuit had a priority setting and so they could cascade through them. This little graph is just showing heat pump water heaters and the, the vertical axis is how many gallons of hot water can I get in the first hour, so morning rush hour. And he, so here's a 70 gallon line going across and then these these four groupings are a 40 gallon tank or a larger 50 gallon tank or 65 or 80 gallon tank. These numbers at the bottom is the number of degrees Fahrenheit of extra heat setting that we would put in there if there was a mixing valve. So at the bottom end of the scale is no mixing valve. And at the top end is a mixing valve and up to 40 degrees overheat. So that might be uh, setting it up to 100 and, 150 Fahrenheit and then mixing cold water in with it so you're still delivering 120 degrees into the pipe so nobody gets scalded. Anyway, what we see is there's a lot of ways to deliver 70 gallons of hot water. The simplest approach is to get the big tank and then you can use a, the 120 volt 
a little blue line here, the 120 volt, oops, wimpy little circuit, but with a big tank can deliver the 70 gallons. You know, or going to the other extreme, you can use a small tank, but you need the big power water heater, the 30 amp water heater, and then other choices are in between. In, in our studies, we went through 10 different example homes and for each of the homes, we would take a look, you know, you might take a picture like this to show your plumber or whoever you're gonna get bids from down to the floor and up to the ceiling if you can, to show the location of the water heater and that'll help people figure out what size water heater will fit. Taking pictures of where your existing air conditioner might be and where the it ties into the furnace and what the existing furnace is like. It helps people figure out what is the equivalent equipment you can use in heat pumps to deliver the same comfort. Uh, measuring the range and then finding a, one that's the same size. And the big issue for ranges is how wide is it? That tends to be the biggest issue. Then, you know, taking a look at the what kind of uh, clothes drying system you want to switch between. A lot of times we were seeing folks had these uh, high amperage resistance dryers and and so we find that we could swip, switch over to these uh, medium amperage hybrids that have resistance and a heat pump, still give you, you know, speedy drying, but more efficient. And then, you know, right sizing the EV charger with the leftover amperage we could find. And then we, you know, pretty much have everything fitting on the panel. This is just a picture of what some of these load management controller boxes might look like or what a smart panel looks like. And then we would also take a look at what is the insulation level. This was an example of a house that needed some upgrading to the insulation when they get around to it. And so we would help them evaluate that, help them work out, you know, where will these circuits be running and what is a list of the circuits that they'll be having? What's a simple description of the project for the contractor to bid on? And Just hopping in briefly to give you a five to 10 minute warning. Uh, All right, thanks. Down but you got a little more time, go for it. Okay. And so we, so we also have the, uh, the guide that we shared with folks that has some of these diagrams about what an electric panel might look like under this watt diet. And so this was one trying to get up to a 3000 square foot home on a hundred amp panel and just seeing how far we have to go. And in that case, we did end up using a circuit, a couple of circuit sharing devices to get there. And then this is that chart I was showing before, just showing that you know folks generally don't use that much of their electric panel. Here they are, down at uh, you know around thirty percent or so. Uh, these these ten homes were before electrification. These two homes are after full electrification, so it's easy to to keep it <laughs> keep under the hundred amps. Um. Anyway, so so some of those you know overview of these ways, there's like six approaches here. You're switching to the more efficient equipment, automate the sequencing of devices using these combined de service devices that do two things, switching to you know, more right-sized or lower draw versions, and then insulating if you want to, or getting a sleeker car, you know, one that gets more miles per kilowatt hour. And then also, you know, it's funny, you, the code is really looking at all the attached devices, not the portable devices. So you can always, you know, since I've shown you in the prior graph, there's a lot of space remaining. You can go in and you don't have to get code permission if you're just using portable devices. All right, so in the Bay Area, we've got a few policy priorities this year. Um, Trying, you know, but the basic issue is, is we've got a problem that uh, the existing fleet of fossil fired machines is has emissions over the course of its the rest of its remaining life, that those emissions will drive us worldwide to two degrees Celsius rise. And so that's over the one and a half degrees uh, target of the Paris Accord. And so every replacement fossil machine that anyone considers for anything they already have, the emissions of the replacement machine is entirely over the top of two degrees Celsius because the initial machine was, was what was driving us to two and the replacement then is over the top. 
So we have to be, be thinking about how do we quickly move to not replacing our fossil machines with more fossil machines. So one of the things we need to do is help our cities uh, keep their reach codes in place and to support the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's zero NOx rules. Uh, they put out zero uh, criteria pollutant rules that uh, go through a 2025 readiness review and then go into effect in the year 2027. And what those rules would do is take polluting equipment off the shelves for water heaters under 75 gallons. And so uh, that'll be nice to have that. Then, then we won't be tempted by the problem being on the shelves. There will be just the solutions on the shelves, like the 120 volt heat pump water heaters will become really common. Anyway, uh, we need to be encouraging a waiver of permit fees for electrification. So talk to your council about that and encourage instant online electric water heater permits um, instead of big plan reviews for that kind of stuff. It's just a water heater. <laughs> so it doesn't take a big plan review. And then in my city, we're trying to get the council to look at a replacement rule for equipment to go into effect maybe at the end of 2023. All right. Well, so anyway, the pitfalls to avoid are avoid power hogs like those 50 amp EV chargers, avoid painting yourself into an expensive corner by picking a lot of big sloppy equipment, and uh, don't wait until your water heater fails to install the necessary circuits or make your plan. You should pr pretty much make your plan now, and if you want circuits, start putting them in because once your device fails, it's so easy to get talked into another gas replacement. And so, you know, don't don't wait for it all to fail. Get going with the pre-wiring and don't oversize your HVAC equipment just to be safe. It it makes it less efficient and less comfortable uh, for for uh, you know maintaining kind of a stable indoor temperature. And then don't undersize your heat pump water heater tank. <laughs> and you know, just go for a bigger tank if you can fit one in. All right, so so maybe I'll just stop that there, and I'll I, I'll provide the slides, which have a few links to some more resources, and maybe open it up if people have a couple minutes of questions. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, great, I will start looking through the the going through the questions in the chat. I'm also going to open the chat back up again if people want to post questions to everyone, but I will try to keep an eye on it, make sure nothing else comes out. Um, and thank you all for your patience with the. Um, with the disruptions. That was really annoying and terrible. I apologize for that. Um, so going through questions on the um, that came in with chat. Um, uh, so let's see. If you have a 120 volt or a 240 volt um, heat pump water heater, is there an appreciable difference in the recovery time? And what is that like difference? Yeah, so in, in their normal heat pump mode, the recovery time's the same. They use the same compressor for the shared circuit uh, 120 volt as as does the 30 amp 240 volt. So, so it's all the same in heat pump mode. The time when the 30 amp one will recover faster is when uh, when the water heater is panicked and you've got it in a uh, you know hybrid mode. And then it'll it'll inject the the resistance heating. You know, I forgot the the exact ratio. It's um, a, about it, but you know, but my strategy is size the tank big enough so I don't have to worry about it, and I don't have to bird dog my water heater and go watch it reheat. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of it. So so take a. You know, I recommend people take a look back at that chart that had the four groupings of, of four different tank sizes and the variables of, of putting in a mixing valve and superheating the water so you get extra gallons of energy delivered. And uh, then take a look at those circuit sizes and just kind of do your choosing among that for, for where you want to end up. Great, thank you. Um, another question that came in in chat is for for this kind of, working out how you're going to stack, you know, um, uh, fully use the amperage on your panel. 
in what circumstances is that something that you can kind of figure out yourself? And in what circumstances do you need an electrician to kind of come in and figure out the, uh, the exact boundaries of what you're going to be able to do? Yeah, I, well, I definitely recommend trying to figure it out yourself. And so I think in the at the uh, end of the slides, you'll you'll see a final slide with resources like to uh, link for the Watt Diet uh, on Redwood Energy Partners. And on there, we have a spreadsheet version of a panel calculator. So if you're okay with entering values into a spreadsheet, it'll help you calculate that yourself. Um, you know, the, the issue about talking to your electrician, a lot of electricians haven't got with this plan yet, and they make money uh, selling you panel upsizing. And so it's like asking your barber if you need a haircut. Uh, the answer is, of course you do. And so you so I recommend trying it yourself. Um, and then uh, also, like I mentioned, companies are coming up with some apps to help make it easy. And then there are these concierge companies also working on solutions. Great. And the question about that specifically, is there any concierge firms that you would in particular um, recommend for electrification projects? Uh, you know, only the ones, only the ones I know of, which are Quit Carbon up in San Francisco and Emerald Eco here on the peninsula. Um, you know, but work with them too, and and you know, let them know if you want to focus on, you know, being this good gridizen and staying on your electric panel, um, or if you're really interested in in going Silicon Valley and, and trying to you know occupy more panel. Totally. And then Lawrence, I see you have a hand up. I think you should be able to unmute now if you want to ask your question or give your comment. And if not, let me know. Oh yeah, go for it. So I'm in Palo Alto and we have a, a rusty gas water heater um, and it's 13 years old and no one's ever replaced the anode. So we figure that that rust means that the glass line on the tank is cracked and eventually this water heater will leak probably sooner than later. So we're saying, okay, it's a rental, but we wanna make it super easy on the landlord. So we've been researching the rebates in Palo Alto to get a heat pump water heater. Well, there's a list, an NEAA list of approved water heaters, but you ask the question, well, which one's 120 volts? So we don't have to wire uh, 240 to the panel, maybe get a panel upgrade because it's only 100 amps. And it's not obvious. So I emailed Jeff Wicks, who's responsible for the list and got a reply. And I wanted to tell you all what to look for on the NEAA list for the 120 volt water heaters to make it easier for you than it was for me um, to find them. So at, at this point, Ream is the only one that has 120 volt water heaters on the approved list. And kinda, there we go. Um, so, I'm going through all these different windows because they don't make it easy. So the, the models are the Proterra plug-in heat pump, and that runs on a dedicated uh, 15 amp, 120 volt circuit, or uh, the, for a shared 15 amp circuit, you have the Ream plug-in heat pump with Hydro Boost. So those names are not on the list, but the model numbers are. So for the Proterra plug-in heat pump, you'll be looking for something that says Pro, pH 50 space 2 space RH120. So that RH120 is a dead giveaway. It's 120 volts. People, people might not have been able to totally retain that spoken. So I wonder if, if you right. have a okay. link to but those so you bottles, could you just put that link in the, in the chat? Now uh, it's not that easy. Um, I can put the NEAA list link into the chat, but as far as I would have to email this thing to you, um, because it's a document you have to log in and create an account and all this stuff in order to see the dang document. So it's not easy to see. Like I say, I had to I see. contact the list creator to get this information. Um, but so if you can remember that you look under Ream, R-H-E-E-M, oh. and if it says RH120, then you know that that is one of the three models of uh, dedicated circuit, uh, 120 volt water heaters. And then unfortunately for the plug-in heat pump with Hydro Boost, that you can plug into a shared circuit, you have a model number that is not intuitive. The one he lists is these are both 50 gallon tanks is XE50T10HM00U0. So uh, how are you gonna remember that? I don't know. Yep. Um, well, um, Lawrence, I, I'll try to send a link to Leo to put it in there. 
Anyway, and they're available, I understand, from the Ream rep by going to Home Depot's Pro Desk, even if you're an amateur, and ordering it across the Pro Desk. And it takes a uh, three weeks, I recently heard, to get one of these in. So, so I just wanted to make the distinction there between a dedicated circuit, mm -hmm. which might mean that you unplug other things from a circuit or wire a new one versus a shared circuit where you can just plug it in with other things being on the circuit, which is uh, well, it doesn't require any electrical permitting as I understand. Hey, hey Tom, Great. Tom, can you hear me? Yeah. I hear Brian, you. We can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, with so little time left, what's the best way to contact you or find information about you? Email, Facebook, Twitter, what do you recommend for future contact? Uh, Tom, my email is Tom G. Cabot, K A B A T, at Gmail. Okay. Great. I saw there were a few other questions and comments in the chat that we weren't able to get to in time, but I really appreciate you all of you being here. Um, and thank you so much to Tom again for this presentation. I'm just going to go through a couple final slides about some information for people. If you live in San Mateo County, um, there are some other rebates um, and kind of other uh, electrification options that are available to you through Peninsula Clean Energy. So anyone who wants to stay on for a couple more minutes and learn about that, um, feel free to. And otherwise, thank you all so much for being here um, and for participating. Um, and I'm going to charge in. Um, so Peninsula Clean Energy is a, a community choice aggregator. It's kind of like a public utility. There are several of these all over the Bay Area. Um, and we recommend you to look in, into the one that you're in the region of, but Peninsula Clean Energy um, sponsors these workshops. So we like to let everybody know about them and, and who they are. So they were founded in 2016 by um, uh, you know, all of the cities uh, and the county supervisors voted unanimously to incorporate them. And they're kind of like a public utility, but not quite. They sort of are only responsible for the generation aspect of getting electricity to you. And they focus on getting clean electricity at lower rates than PG&E would provide otherwise. So they've provided a bunch of savings for the people who are, are their um, customers in San Mateo County. If you live in San Mateo County, it's pretty likely that you're already kind of automatically opted into them, but it might be worth looking into because often you can get cheaper electricity. And the most relevant part for anyone here who's interested in um, electrification is they have a ton of really great new um, home electrification programs that if you go to their website and look at their all electric homes page, you can learn about. So they have um, for folks uh, under certain qualifying income thresholds, a bunch of huge just rebates and direct support available for electrification projects. And then they also have some very low interest or zero interest loans for slightly higher income um, folks who wanna electrify uh, to you know, help you get the savings from your if high efficiency devices and use that to pay off the cost of actually doing this work. So if you live in San Mateo County, super highly recommend that you check out their programs if you wanna do um, electrification. Uh, and you can always like go to their website and contact them to learn more. They have tons of information and resources um, for, for the people in their service territory. That is to clarify, not in the city of Palo Alto specifically, which has its own municipal utility. Um, and then, yeah, one more time. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you for bearing with um, our Zoom bomber problems uh, and, and sticking through. Um, and definitely recommend you go to Actera's website as well, actera.org. We have tons of event like, events like this, um, all kinds of educational events on various topics. Um, and you can keep in touch with us and see our future things. Tom is a, a pretty regular um, Actera face. He comes in and gives our audience uh, uh, lots of great information in various contexts uh, every once in a while. So you'll see him again at some point probably and, and more people like him. Um, and thank you all so much again for being here. Yep, thanks everyone and good luck out there. All right, I'm going to close the meeting. Have a great night, everyone.